Hello, this is Nassim Miller, House Reporter at the Orlando Sentinel, and we are here today with Dr. Kenneth Alexander, Chief of Infectious Diseases at Nemours Children's Hospital, and we are here to talk about COVID vaccines. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you so much for making time to talk to us about vaccines, and there are tons of questions. So maybe we can start with the basic one, which has been a big one for me too, is it looks like there are different kinds of vaccines. Is that true? There are several vaccines that are being developed. The first two that are out there, the vaccine by Pfizer and the second one by Moderna, are actually very, very similar. And what they are are little pieces of mRNA, so little tiny pieces of, of genetic information that go into the cytoplasm of the cell and lead to expression of the protein that the virus makes so that we can mount an immune response to this. The two vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna's, are very, very similar. They're not yet viewed as interchangeable, but uh, I think they're very, very similar to one another. But they don't prevent you from getting infections, do they? It's a truism in vaccines, that vaccines don't always prevent infection, but they attenuate disease. So if you look in the clinical trials, both trials were 90, or both vaccines rather in the trials, were 95% effective at preventing symptomatic disease. Now, could people have had mild or asymptomatic disease? Yes, and we anticipate seeing those data coming out in the clinical trials in the weeks to come. The other important thing is in the patients who got vaccinated, who got COVID, their cases were very mild compared to the people who got the placebo and got COVID. So the vaccine will probably reduce the risk of transmission, but we know for certain that the vaccine will reduce the severity of disease. It will keep you out of the hospital. And I'm curious, is that how the flu vaccine works? Because that's one of the vaccines that a lot of us get too. Very similar. The flu vaccine is probably only about 50% effective at preventing culture-proven influenza, yet is virtually 100% effective at keeping somebody out of the hospital. So it's the same idea. Now, when it comes to these two, especially these two vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, there are two shots. You are supposed to get them about 21 or 20 days apart. Are you supposed to get both shots? I mean, what if you get the first shot and you don't get the second one? It's important to get both shots. Now, when you have a two-dose series like this, the way I want people to think about it is that the first dose says to your immune system, wake up and pay attention. The second dose, given three to four weeks later, depending on the different vaccine, says to your immune system, remember this, don't forget it. Now, if you look closely at both Pfizer and Moderna's data, even one dose conferred some degree of protection, perhaps 50 to 60 percent. But to really get the full benefit, you've got to have both doses. And I guess we don't know with the first dose how long that even the 50 percent is going to last because that the clinical trials didn't look at that, right? You're spot on. Uh, uh, in, a, in a trial like this, we want to make sure that people get two doses. Uh, we want to make sure that people that are being studied are getting the vaccine in the exact way we intend to give it to the population. Experience with vaccines teaches us that one dose probably doesn't have the same long-term effect as two doses, but that varies somewhat between vaccine mechanisms, and there are vaccines being studied that will be a single dose. We usually don't think about the brand of vaccine we're getting, but now all of a sudden we have Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson is, is probably down the line. Does it matter at this point or should, once this becomes more widely available, of course, should we ask for a specific uh, brand of vaccine? Does it may matter which one we take? This is a really interesting question. And you're absolutely right. Quite often with vaccines, we are... Uh, we don't pay attention to the brand. We don't pay attention to who manufactures it. And here, there may be some differences between the different brands. Now, I think Pfizer and Moderna's are going to be very, very similar. But there are other companies coming down the road where their vaccines work by different mechanisms and they may have different levels of efficacy 
they may have different kinds of side effect profiles. And so there may be some differences. That being said, you know, when it when it comes to a vaccine, this is like somebody throwing you a life ring when you're drowning. Don't ask what brand the life ring is. Grab the first one you can get. Um, and, and I guess the advice, too, is if you get the first dose of Pfizer, you're supposed to also get your second dose uh, of Pfizer vaccine, not a Moderna. That's correct. If you if you start with Pfizer, get a second dose of Pfizer. If your first dose is Moderna, make sure your second dose is Moderna. What if you have had COVID? Are you supposed to get vaccinated still? Absolutely. It turns out that when you have COVID, certainly you do mount some immunity. The good news is you can mount a lot of immunity, but it turns out that the people that mount a lot of immunity are the ones that got really, really sick. And the milder your case of COVID, the less impressive your immunity is. We've learned from the other coronavirus infections, right, SARS-1 and MERS, that immunity lasts for perhaps six months to tops two years. It turns out with these vaccines, the antibody response, the immune response is probably 10, 100, maybe even a thousand times more robust than you get with wild type disease. So even if you've had COVID-19, you should receive the vaccine. So how about, I mean, of course the question is, especially during winter times, Uh, are you supposed to take COVID and flu vaccine together, again, when COVID vaccine is widely available, or how's that going to work? It's now mid-December, so I hope most people have had their flu vaccine already. Uh, if you've not had your flu vaccine, I would certainly encourage you to get your flu vaccine, because just like COVID, influenza virus is capable of causing a terrible damaging infection to your lungs. Now, right now, we don't have a lot of experience about what happens if we give vaccines together with COVID or if people have received vaccines in the previous two weeks. So as a precaution, the CDC has said, we don't want you to have had another vaccine in the two week period preceding your COVID vaccine. So if you're going to get influenza vaccine, what I would do is get my COVID vaccine first, and then get my influenza vaccine later. If you're not in a position to get COVID vaccine right yet, jump for that flu vaccine as quickly as you can. But we want them to be separated by two weeks. Again, the CDC is making this recommendation not because there's really any information. They're making this recommendation out of an abundance of caution. Talking about caution here, Do you um, do we know whether pregnant women or lactating women should get the COVID vaccine when the time comes? What's the recommendation on that right now? There are recommendations that pregnant women and lactating women can receive the COVID vaccine. It's always interesting that when you do a large clinical trial, in this case, there's 50,000 people have received either the Merck or the Moderna vaccine, that there are a number of women in the trials who turn out to be, surprise, surprise, you're pregnant. And the good news is they've done very, very well. Atop this, we appreciate that pregnancy is actually a risk factor for severe COVID disease. And so I would feel absolutely terrible if I heard about a pregnant woman having severe COVID. By all means, if you're pregnant, get immunized. And that same goes for influenza, because it turns out pregnancy and influenza are a really bad mix. And again, with precautions, there, there have been few reports of uh, several people who have received the vaccine and have had severe allergic reaction to it. Uh, what do we know about that? Should people worry about it? Where do we stand? The good news here is that the allergic reactions appear to be very, very rare. Uh, so far, the world experience is something that you can probably count the number of people having these reactions on one at most two hands. So this is, this is very, very rare. And certainly, you have to bear in mind that there have been no fatal reactions. And even if there's been, say, 10 reactions in, in this whole time, in America, 
someone's dying of COVID-19 every 30 seconds. So we need to push through this vaccine. And part of the responsibility of being a good immunizer is that you're prepared for people to have reactions. And so where vaccines are being given, preparations have been made. Assuming, you know, the vaccine is available to us in the community or even folks who have been vaccinated right now who have received their first dose, is does that give them a free pass to now go to indoor uh, dining and hanging out with friends and family without a mask? Uh, what does it mean when you get your first dose? That's a wonderful question. And I wish, boy, I wish the answer to that were yes. There's two parts to that, of course. Um, when we get the vaccine, when we get one dose, our immunity is, is not complete. And even when we get two doses, we're still not completely sure that we're not able to transmit. Now, I think we probably won't, but we just don't know that for sure. The other challenge we have is that when you get a vaccine, nobody's putting a purple spot on your forehead. So we don't know walking down the street who's been vaccinated and who's not. And so until we have a high level of immunity in our country, I think we're all going to be wearing masks for the safety of each other. Can you talk about that immunity? I guess we hear the word herd immunity. What is it that this vaccine is going to do eventually to, you know, end this pandemic in a way? So the buzz phrase here is immunity in the community. What we want to do is make sure that enough people have this vaccine that the, the infection sort of fizzles out. In other words, if you get vaccinated, I get COVID, I can't transmit to you. And if enough people around me get vaccinated, then I can't transmit to anybody. So what we want to do is make sure that enough people in our community are vaccinated that the infection basically fizzles out. The mathematics, what we understand of the virus, suggests that that's going to take about 60% of people in the community getting vaccinated. COVID's pretty infectious, so we need to have about 60% of the people in the community vaccinated before we see this virus sort of fizzle out. So talking about infectious, can you talk a little bit, or what do you know, do we know right now about this new strain that everybody's talking about, or like a mutated strain of COVID? Or so there's a lot of, lot of excitement in Britain right now where they're seeing this strain that they believe is more infectious. Now, how do they know this? What they're doing is sampling all the different COVID-19 infections. And what they're seeing is this one strain is becoming much, much more prevalent. That's telling us that it's transmitting more effectively. So far, there's no data to suggest that it's any more virulent. It doesn't make you any sicker. And there are no data that suggest that it's resistant to the vaccine. It just transmits more effectively. Well, in some ways, that's what viruses are trying to do, right? They wanna go from person to person. And it's kind of like practice. So as time goes on, we can expect to see that some viruses do become more infectious. But again, the good news is, we're not seeing more severe disease, and we're certainly not seeing any suggestions that this new strain is resistant to the vaccine in any way. So a couple of technical questions. Um, eventually, do you think companies or even health systems uh, can sort of force or mandate that their employees get vaccinated? I think we're a long ways from that right now. Now, mandated is a, a dirty word in libertarian America. And when we require a vaccine, say for children to go to school or for employees to receive flu vaccine to work in a hospital, that decision is based on years, often decades of data, where we have an understanding of the efficacy and effectiveness of the vaccine. We've got a decade or more of experience on the safety of the vaccine, and we know it works and we know it makes a difference. In the case of the COVID-19 vaccines, we still just have months of experience. Now, could we see a vaccine requirement for COVID-19 10, 15 years from now? Maybe, but at that point, I hope we're not going to need it. So I don't 
anticipate, and certainly in an institution like Nemours, we are not requiring our employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19. It's their choice. How about the cost of the vaccine? Do we know eventually, I mean, who's going to pay for this or are we having to pay for this vaccine? What do we know right now? So these are your tax dollars at work. Uh, right now, the federal government is is paying for a vaccine. Uh, I don't think there's any plan to, to change that right now. Uh, and I think to get as many Americans immunized as we can, that's the course we'll stay on for the foreseeable future. How about children? I guess this vaccine hasn't been tested in children yet. Where do we stand when it comes to COVID vaccine for kids? Getting a COVID vaccine for kids is going to be very exciting because, as you appreciate, this is going to be important for having our schools open, for protecting our teachers, protecting family members, protecting grandparents, the whole bit. The good news is that children do very well with COVID. In Florida, we've had very, very few pediatric fatalities with COVID. So in some ways, the fact that children are last is okay because they do the best. The studies to look at COVID vaccination of children are just now starting. And so I anticipate that we will have some answers probably by late summer. I'm not sure yet whether we'll have COVID vaccine in time for school to start, but we might start vaccinating children during first semester. In the meantime, I do think once we get past healthcare providers and emergency service workers, the teachers should be very high on our list of who to vaccinate next. Based on what we know right now and this other mutated strain out there, do you expect this COVID vaccine to become something like the flu vaccine where every year you have to get it? So far, the immunity to this vaccine looks to be very, very impressive. You may remember that the reason we get a flu vaccine every year is because flu changes quite a bit from year to year. The changes we're seeing in COVID-19 in the SARS-CoV-2 virus are tiny compared to the changes that we see in influenza. So I don't think that we're going to need to get an annual COVID vaccine. My suspicion is it'll be a little bit more like your tetanus shot, that maybe you'll get it every seven to 10 years. You know, you talk to patients, you talk to a lot of your staff and employees. What do you think is the biggest misconception about this vaccine, the vaccines that, is, that are rolling out? People worry that the vaccine was rushed. Uh, now, when the government names the program Operation Warp Speed, that sort of sounds rushed. But I want people to appreciate that the pathway that this vaccine, that both these vaccines took to approval is the same road that every vaccine takes. The same studies, the same reviews. The difference is, is that instead of going down that road at 55 miles an hour, this was all hands on deck. And we were going down that road at 85 miles an hour. When the FDA did their review, rather than saying, thank you for your application, we'll review it in six months, the FDA said, Thank you for the, the, your application. Let's get to work. So the acceleration was not a shortcut. It was an acceleration. What do you tell people who are hesitant to get this vaccine when it's available to them? People, when they accept or are considering vaccination, really want to know three things. First, does it work? And I can share with you the clinical data that it works. 95% is a good number. Second, is it safe? We've got now several months of data. We don't have years of data yet, but we've gotten months of data. And what we've learned so far is that the biggest side effect is that it gives you a sore arm and that sometimes you'll have a little bit of a fever and achiness for a day or so. But all these other scary, serious adverse events, they were not seen in the clinical trials. And even the allergic reactions are tremendously rare. And then the most important thing, especially as providers talk to families, is what is your recommendation? And the recommendation should not be, it's available, you can have it if you want it. The recommendation is this, I got vaccinated yesterday 
And the reason I got vaccinated yesterday was to protect my family, to protect my colleagues, to protect my patients, to protect people I haven't even met yet. And because I want to get rid of this darn mask and I want to see our economy back on its feet and my friends back at work. And so this is something we're doing not just for ourselves. This is something we're doing for everybody around us. And then I sometimes joke that immunization is really a gesture of love. And so we really have to remind ourselves that when you vaccinate somebody you care about, that's a way of saying I love you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. It was a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate you giving us all this information and I'm sure our readers and viewers will benefit from your information. Thank you again and happy holidays. Thank you. I look forward to talking again.